I'm a professor of environmental philosophy. And since most people that I say that to have no idea what I'm talking about, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. One of the things that I study is the relationship between fish and forests. And that probably doesn't clear things up very much at all, does it? <laughs> I spend uh, a lot of time in libraries, of course, reading law, reading uh, environmental science, trying to understand the biology of fish, the biology of forests, what's going on with fish and forests. I'm concerned with this, though, as an environmental philosopher, because I want to make sure that the way that we interact with the woods that we have and with the fish that we have is something that's sustainable for the long haul. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of a downer. We are fishing our way down the food chain around the world. But the good news is, I think it's not too late to change that. And what I do as an environmental philosophy professor is I want to teach my students how to care for every piece of the ecosystem in which the fish live. So in addition to going to the libraries and trying to find out uh, what I can about the fish there, I spend a lot of time in places like Alaska, up in the Arctic, in Lake Clark National Park, and down in Guatemala and Belize. Uh, I teach in Spain and Morocco and in Greece as well, just to look at the way that we're using fish in different parts of the world. Now, what you're looking at right here, this is a picture I took up in Alaska. This is a male sockeye salmon. You can tell he's male because of the hooked jaw. Uh, he's a, it's a sockeye salmon. You can tell the color, the bright red color. That's the color that it turns when it's spawning. So this is a fish that has spent the last few years of its life in the ocean, and it's come back up river in order to spawn. I was in my tent in a place where we get 23 and a half hours of sunlight in the summertime, trying to figure out when I can fall asleep, and thinking about this question, whose responsibility is this fish? Who owns these fish? Whose fish are these? And Sometimes that feels like a very silly question, because I don't even know how you answer that question. But it becomes an even more strange question when you're lying in your tent, and about an arm's reach away from you, the, the grizzly bear starts to sniff at your tent, and you realize, oh, I'm here to study the ecosystem, and in so doing, I have become part of the ecosystem. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you tonight about, or today is about, is uh, bear poop and unnecessary knowledge. <laughs> and hopefully none of us ever become either of those two. <laughs> so here's a picture of some bear poop. I took this picture uh, in Alaska, and I want you to have a look at it. I, I know you're probably thinking, Dave, I just had breakfast, I'm not really interested. But look at what you see there. Of course, there's the brown that kind of fills up most of it, that's the poop part. But do you see what else is in there? Seeds seeds, and even some undigested berries. Think about this. There are plants out there that, if you will, know that they're going to be eaten by bears. And the berries, some of the berries don't get digested. And the bears become the way that those seeds move around from one place to another. And not only that, when the bear poops, the seeds are now in fertilizer. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's as though the plants and the bears knew that they were part of an ecosystem because the bears are later going to eat those berries. This is another picture of bear poop that I took up in Alaska. And here you don't see so many seeds. Probably the seeds have been picked away by birds, but you see what is in here. The, the little round things that you're looking at up there, those are vertebrae of salmon. And the long white things, those are the rib bones of salmon as well. So in the summertime, when summertime hits Alaska, the bears go out and they feast on salmon when the salmon come running back up the rivers, and they feast on berries, and these two things join together in the bears, and when the bear poops, you've got this salmon-flavored bear poop that's full of blueberries. It's pretty fantastic. So here's another one of those sockeye salmon. There's a, another little sad thing that I have to tell you about salmon, and that is that most salmon, when they spawn, they die, which means that their children are born as orphans. Most salmon are born as orphans. But the salmon nevertheless take care of their children by continuing to be part of this ecosystem. So what you're looking at right here is fish and forests right next to one another. Do you see it? Now, all that's needed 
is for something to take that fish out of the water and bring it up onto the land. One way that happens, of course, is when the bear eats it and you saw the bear poop. This right here is the jawbone of one of those salmon, and do you see all the plants that are growing around it, that are growing in the body of that salmon? Now think about this. This is a marvelous mystery. These fish, when they're a few centimeters long, when they weigh a few grams, they swim down the river into the ocean, and they live there for years, and they vanish from our sight. We don't do a very good job yet of tracking where those fish go, but we do know that when they come back, they might weigh a thousand times or more what they weighed when they went out. Here's another interesting, marvelous mystery. When the rain falls on the mountains, and you can verify this by looking at a satellite map, pull up Google Maps, not now, but later, uh, right now you should be tweeting about TEDx, Fargo. But you can look at a satellite map of a river mouth, anywhere a river goes into the ocean, and you'll see it makes a fan shape. And that fan shape is all the alluvium, it's all the sediments, it's all the nutrients from that mountain that have washed down to the ocean. When these salmon swim back upstream, what they've done is they've gone down the river and they've gathered up all those nutrients again in the form of all the things that they've eaten that have been fed on those nutrients, and they return them to the mountain. In a way, salmon are the way that mountains swim back home. Now, I could talk to you for a long time about bear poop and about unnecessary knowledge. I want to focus on the unnecessary knowledge part, and I'm going to take you down to Guatemala just for a moment. I was with some rangers in the Paten Forest up in northeastern Guatemala two years ago, and we were drinking tea made from one of the trees that was hanging over us, and I saw some lizards running by. And you probably can't see it, but there's four lizards in this picture. You can see right at the top, there's one that's kind of blurry right there. There's three more that look just like it in the picture. And I could not get my camera to focus on them. And I snuck up slowly to the, to the lizard so that it wouldn't get scared away. You can sort of see one of the lizards right over there. And of course, there's this one here. And there's two others that look just like it. And I could not get the camera to focus on it. I wanted to get a picture of that lizard, because when I'm in the wild, you see, I like to document what I'm, there, what I'm seeing there, and then bring it home, and I can show it to my students. So later on, when I got back home, I, could, I simply couldn't get the camera to focus on this lizard. When I got back home, I looked at this and zoomed in just a little bit closer and saw what my camera was looking at that I failed to notice. Do you see it at the bottom of the screen? much bigger than the lizard. There was a frog sitting there closer to me than the lizard, looking right at me, and somehow I didn't see it. Here's the thing. You and I, when we have a task to do, we go out looking for the things that we think we need to, to know. When I go up to Alaska wanting to understand the fish and asking the question, who's responsible for these fish? I go to look for the fish and then a bear shows up outside my tent and starts sniffing while I'm trying to sleep. When I go to Guatemala, I see something really cool like this lizard, and I really focus on it. I think that's the thing that I need to take a picture of. When you're training your, the people that you're supervising, when you're sending your children off to school, think about the ways that we do this. We say, well, what you need to do is learn these things. Focus on that. Do those things. And what I want to advocate for today is more than that. Don't just go to the library. Don't just focus on the trees and miss the fish, or the other way around. But take some time to look at the bear poop in your life. <laughs> now, this is definitely not something very attractive. It's not something that you want to track home. You don't want to have this on your shoe when you return from a hiking trip. It's an absolute mess. But aren't there a whole lot of things in our lives that feel like that? They feel like a distraction. Maybe it's even people in your life who feel like a distraction. Maybe it's the weeds, the things that we've called weeds. Maybe it's simply the study of poetry. For some reason, every culture in the world has written poetry and preserved it for thousands of years. And for some reason, most of us don't read it, because it doesn't feel like it's quite got the the necessity, like it's worth our time. I'm going to leave you with one more image. It's not the same image, but it's, something that I, it's a picture I took right next to this one. Imagine the bear comes by, it's eaten some salmon, it's eaten some berries, 
and then it deposits this that you see right here. Now let the sun and the rain work on it for just a little while. And this is what you get. What's the bear poop in your life? And how might it be a mound of fertility that's just waiting for you to pay attention to it? Thanks.